Hello and many thanks for joining us. You're watching Addis News Hour from the Ethiopian Broadcasting Corporation. With the news, I'm Tabitha John. Do stay with us. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia held phone conversations on bilateral and current issues. According to Turkey's presidential communications, the call addressed Turkish-Ethiopian relations and regional issues. During the phone call, President Erdogan stated that Turkey would continue to provide every kind of support to Ethiopia in its desire for development. He also underscored that Turkey attaches great importance importance to Ethiopia's serenity and stability. USAID Administrator Samantha Power is due to visit Addis Ababa. She says her visit is to press the government of Ethiopia to allow full and unhindered humanitarian access to prevent famine in Ethiopia's Tigray state. But many are voicing concern that this is part of a conspiracy of opening up a so-called humanitarian corridor to arm the TPLF and weaken Ethiopia through prolonged conflicts. In the following reportage, Shifara Ulako looks into some articles in this regard. In her own words, Samantha Power is coming to Ethiopia to press the government of Ethiopia to allow full and unhindered humanitarian access to prevent famine in Ethiopia's Tigray region. But while Ethiopia is a sovereign nation with all the legal mandate to decide on major routes and corridors, the Western world is erroneously pressurizing the East African nation to open up the Sudanese border. This, according to many Ethiopians, is a recipe for disaster. Ethiopians have already begun voicing disapproval of her visits as there should not be free corridor in any sovereign country and also such requests by aid agencies that endangers the security and safety of the country. There has been a conspiracy on the part of the TPLF and its Western cronies to have the Sudanese corridor opened. The TPLF has come up with its so-called border issue of the Wolkait so that Ethiopian armed forces leave the border town of Humara. If and when this happens, then the TPLF and its allies will use the corridor for unhindered access to weapons. In an article featured on the Star, an Ethiopian political analyst, Wassan Malaku, with years of experience in teaching and research, writes that starvation must be averted by all means. However, in trying to press the government of Ethiopia to allow full and unhindered humanitarian access to Tigray, the writer urges her to understand the situation on the ground better. Critical as humanitarian access is, it is not necessarily in the gift of the Ethiopian government alone. The senseless war imposed by the TPLF has made access to Tigray a dangerous adventure. While Power's initiative is noble in the words of the writer, the U.S. aid chief must have lost the real picture when she laid everything on the Ethiopian government arguing that the TPLF was using hunger as a means of blockade and trying to win the Western attention, the writer calls for caution. Citing that the TPLF is leaving no stone unturned to undeservedly use the genocide claim for its purpose, the writer urges power to understand the reality as a former seasoned journalist with exposure to gripping stories like the Bosnia War. Samantha Power, the writer argues, might still be unduly influenced by the press rather than wait for clear evidence. So she is accused of reaching unwarranted conclusion on the make-believe genocide claims flung on the Ethiopian government by the likes of Christoph. Christoph is writing and tweeting on Ethiopia today, routinely and wrongly accusing the Ethiopian government of deliberately starving its citizens in Tigray and praising the distorted, malicious and irresponsible reporting by his NYT colleague Dilkan Welsh. The writer urges power to allow herself the patience to watch, listen and learn, just as her younger self did in Croatia back then, that the Amharas and Tigrayans are not Serbs and Croats. Ethiopia is not Yugoslavia. According to the writer, the war is imposed on Ethiopia by a criminal gang bent on returning itself to power to play Act 2 of its quasi apartheid minority rule over the rest of Ethiopia. The people of Tigray, 
are its primary victims considered only as a tool for its selfish agenda. No group is more hated and despised than the TPLF in Ethiopia today or ever. The writer urges power to listen to her hostess during her time in Addis. He says, I recall how frustrated Miss Power was when Osan Suji rejected her commendable attempts to persuade her to condemn the persecution of the Rohingya during her visit in 2012. In making the case for congressional authorization of the use of force against Assad in 2015, Ms. Powell wrote memorably, quote, I believed that the most important part of decision-making was not the justness of one's intentions, but the effectiveness of one's actions. This time on Ethiopia, her humanitarian cause is just but the background diplomatic saber-rattling is worrying with potentially catastrophic consequences. The writer says, I urge Ms. Power and her government to exercise caution. The whole world is watching Africa even more so. Ethiopia matters. In fact, the TPLF bandits and its task for allies are openly denouncing Ethiopia and Ethiopianism as the following video clearly shows. <laughs> On another note, Professor Alamayo Gabramariam writes that there is substantial evidence Hillary Clinton, Susan Rice, and Samantha Power were the three principal advocates of war against Libya in 2011, setting the North African nation on a free fall ever since. Since November 2020, the likes of Susan Rice, Anthony Blinken, and Jake Sullivan have been openly and publicly looking for Ethiopia's breaking point, he has argued. For more brief over the phone about USAID Administrator Samantha Power's visit to Addis Ababa, here is Dr. Jonas Adaye, Director of Institute for Peace and Security Studies in the Addis Ababa University. Welcome and thank you very much for your time, Dr. Jonas. You're welcome. So, as you heard it, her visit is to press the government of Ethiopia to allow full and unhindered humanitarian access to prevent famine in Ethiopia's Tigray. It is quite surprising how she is, quote-unquote, worried about Ethiopians. Is she really worried about Ethiopians, though? What do you think about this? That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, the most important point is whether she truly is worried about Ethiopia or maybe for their previous commitment to the previous, particularly TVLF-led EPIDF government. So it is quite open question to the entire international community. So in my personal view, I think it is quite good to see it from at least two or three angles. The first one is this person has been working for such a long time, over maybe 10 to 20 years, to my understanding, uh, when I see her textbooks, uh, her, her excellent work on humanitarian dignities, she might be concerned, as we saw in some parts of Africa and Europe. However, when you come back to Ethiopian situation, I think it's it seems to be a leap service. We must be very careful. Secondly, it is also good to, for us to notice that people listen to what they like to listen to rather than what you tell them. People see what they like to see rather than what is objectively on the ground. So, to my understanding, the concern, the worry, is more of why TPLF should be leaving it is control in the command center and be away from the remote control from Washington DC. So that's really what I can possibly say to your excellent question indeed. Okay, so it seems she's coming with pressure to Ethiopia. How do you think it's better to treat United States unfair intervention in Ethiopian affairs? What's the best approach? It also is very useful for us to really remember Ethiopia-U.S. relations goes well over 120 years, and we really had, most of the time, very peaceful, amicable, and internationally acceptable relations. Don't forget that both countries 
uh, were and are founders of the League of Nations, and, then, and the, again, the, U, the UN or United Nations as well. And they've been working, you know, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, in fighting terrorism in Eastern Africa. And at the same time, of course, they're fighting HIV AIDS. And so, you know, we have very many areas of cooperation. However, the caveat here is that Ethiopia is a sovereign nation. So you also should underline that security or peace is indivisible. You don't have a such Ethiopia's peace or America's peace. Whatever happens to Ethiopia negatively absolutely affects the U.S. as well. Simple example is what happened in Afghanistan, in Iraq, affected in 9-11 case, and so through terrorism, through migration, uh, and, and definitely that it should be a sort of collective security aspect rather than simply focusing on us as if Ethiopia is an isolated an island or an extension of a, a sort of a colonized country. So I think that is absolute misperception. And so uh, the pressure that they are trying to apply on Ethiopia, to my understanding, is absolutely misguided and based on manufactured and founded propaganda. So it is now time for them to really look again and revisit source of their information, rather than being simply led by sensational news for the two countries to look back at their excellent history they had together, and at the same time look at the brighter future in the, in, the, in the coming foreseeable future. So I think that would be a wiser way, because definitely the U.S. needs Ethiopia, as well as Africa, the best way to enter into the rest of Africa is through Ethiopia, as Ethiopia is the seat of not only AU, but the ECA, which is UN an extension, and the EU, and many others, of course, are you know, taking part. So Ethiopia had this pivotal role to play in not only here in Africa, but even globally as well. So you can think of Ethiopia's contribution in peacekeeping or peace support operation. So I think simply overburdening Ethiopia currently led by TPL propaganda to me is absolutely unwise and it's time for the U.S. to reconsider their foreign policy. All and right, so all right, Dr. Jonas. Yeah, sure. For the sake of the time, I'll have to cut you short and go to my final question for you tonight. So what do you suggest for the Ethiopian government to defend her pressures in diplomatic manner? Tell us principles in tackling undesired pressures. Right. Um, you, you have this international relations principle that most of the time is national interest that drives people into amicable relationships and working together. So I think the principle that Ethiopia already uh, ratified, accepted under the UN uh, um, uh, rules and the regulations is that non-interference as well as, of course, non-indifference when there is agreement. So that must be respected in the first place. Number two, Ethiopia has to also unite her own people here and also respect, that is, have her allies with whoever can work with Ethiopia so as to respect Ethiopia's territorial integrity and the unity of the people. And number three, Ethiopia should also work together with regional, international, and global organizations. They could be uh, non-state as well as state actors as well. So I think it is time to, to, for Ethiopia as well as for the United, United States to definitely, you know, uh, water down the, uh, this escalating news and look back into their glorious stories and, of course, work together. That's what I can possibly advise for this moment. All right. Dr. Jonas Adaye, Director of Institute for Peace and Security Studies with the Addis Ababa University, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. Have a great evening. And you too. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Asked by the BBC about the difficulty of getting aid to Tigray Regional State, the Atlantic Council's Deputy Director of the Center for Africa said that the cause is the TPLF itself. The director said although the government of Ethiopia had declared a unilateral ceasefire, the TPLF terrorist group has not stopped fighting with neighboring Amhara and Afar Regional States. She also described the TPLF clip as a group that has been torturing 
Ethiopians for 30 years. Let's take a look. There are fears that this crisis uh, could worsen given further fighting. Let's get more on this story for you. Uh, Bronwyn Bruton is the di Deputy Director of the Africa Centre at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Uh, Bronwyn, thanks for joining us on BBC News. Uh, what are you hearing about the ability of these uh, aid trucks to get through? Well, obviously, it's been a tremendous challenge for aid agencies to get through to Tigray for a number of different reasons. Um, one of them being that the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, which is the rebel group that's fighting the Ethiopian army, has not accepted a ceasefire that's been implemented by the Ethiopian government and has expanded its war outside of Tigray into the neighboring regions, including Afar, which is the area that's being used as a staging ground, uh, the only route available indeed to get um, supplies into Makale. And so this has caused an incredible backlog that aid agencies claim is being aggravated by the Ethiopian government. It must be hard actually for the aid ag agencies to know where to get the supplies to. They'll be looking at camps, they'll be looking at almost refugee settlements, but people are still on the move. There is a great deal of population displacement in the region, although it is reported that since the TPLF is now entirely in control of Tigray, that much of those movements have settled down and that the delivery of aid within Tigray itself, once the aid can get in, has actually become a little bit more simple than it was when the area was an active conflict zone. And you were saying, you know, fighting is still going on, indeed ha has been spreading. I mean, there are deep roots to this tension, to the, to the anger between the different factions in Ethiopia. There are. Uh, obviously, the TPLF was a dictatorship for almost 30 years, and it ruled Ethiopia brutally. Um, since the coming to power of Api Ahmed, um, the TPLF has mostly been confined in its own northern region, but in November it launched an attack on federal forces, which has led to a long and increasingly brutal conflict between the two sides. There's an insurgency that's underway in Tigray, and the TPLF has threatened even to march on Addis Ababa in an effort to retake power at the national level. This has obviously caused Ethiopians who lived in terror of the TPLF for decades to feel a great deal of, of fear and anger. And it's leading to reprisals, particularly among the Afar and Amhara communities against aid workers who are trying to deliver aid that they fear will be diverted to the TPLF. Bronwyn. Deputy Director General of the Ethiopian Mass Media Authority, Yonatan Tesfaye, recently said the biased media coverage of the law enforcement operation in Tigray hampered the international community from realizing the truth about Ethiopia's situation. Mr. Yonatan is with us on the phone. Welcome, Mr. Yonatan. Hello, good evening. You say foreign media have prevented the international community from knowing the reality on the ground by distorting information about Ethiopia. How did you come to this conclusion? Give us your justifications, please. So the media authority has been following the stories that have been published and broadcasted uh, via international medias. And we monitor it daily. And we have a trained uh, analysis that we make. And based on our findings, it has been uh, outrageously uh, disappointing and unprofessional that many of them um, have been engaged in uh, disinformation and misinformation, uh, publishing and broadcasting uh, even video contents, doctored video contents that cannot be authenticated and uh, cannot be verified. Uh, that is uh, still continuing even uh, to this day. Um, just uh, ju just a moment ago, I, I was I was just watching uh, or reading a story published on one of the international medias about dead bodies found in uh, a, a, a reef, and uh, they come up with some stories that they cannot verify. So this has been going on for the past uh, seven or six months. Continuously, so at the beginning we told, or our assessment was that it was because of the lack of information or 
because they are reporting from uh, very far away. But uh, recently we've come to conclude or have um, or the, the evidence is the train shows that it is rather um, a very coordinated uh, uh, campaign against the Ethiopian government in, in general, the, uh, Ethiopia, uh, in, in regards to the law enforcement operation in Tigray. So using that as an excuse, uh, it seems that the information warfare is onto something which is negative for uh, Ethiopia and its ter territory and integrity and national security. So it, ha it has hampered hugely to, to shadow what has been going on in Ethiopia, to deprive of the international community to know what the facts and the truth is. Okay, Jonathan, how about urging them on applying professional ethics? And why do you think they went the wrong way? What's behind them disseminating this unverifiable information, distorted information about our country? Various reasons, indeed. Uh, one being that, uh, as you all know, TPLF has been controlling the countries, um, um, you know, using their, their, their power for 30 years. They had networks and they have the financial capacity that they looted um, from the Ethiopian, uh, from the public uh, resource that they have been using. So uh, the, that money has been spent on lobbyist groups and uh, even many international organizations, are, I believe, are compromised. They have people everywhere that uh, can help them propagate their false informations and disinformations. And uh, even journalists that are uh, working for international organizations later have been found uh, or announced that they joined the terrorist group. So you can imagine before raising arm and joining the terrorist group, obviously they have been using the international media to um, to advance their, the, the terrorist group's agenda. Uh, so one being that they have been in power for 30 years and the networks and the money that they have looted have helped, it, helped them in, in, in disseminating false information uh, through their networks. And another thing would be uh, the, the, the different interest groups uh, that have interests in the region, you know, the geopolitics. Uh, many players have, they, they, they claim to have some stake. And uh, recently, I mean, in the, in, in the last three years, the Ethiopian government and Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has been seen as a, a uniting figure and uh, a very uh, pan-Africanist -Af who talks about and who does things to integrate the region economically and socially, and I don't think this has been viewed as a positive uh, progress because of uh, different stakeholders or different actors that believe that they have an interest. And uh, even in some media, it has been uh, published that uh, Eritrea, Somalia, and Ethiopia, the leaders in these countries, are portrayed as something uh, destructive force in the region. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the unity, the integration is supposed to be celebrated, but uh, some media has portrayed this as some sort of uh, negative. So uh, in Egypt and the, the Nile, uh, I mean the dam on the Nile and all this uh, could be considered. And it, it, it all played out, the, 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 the geopolitics and the, um, what's happening in the region all played out in the media mm -hmm. using the terrorist group um, uh, and uh, it is insurgents. All right. So I believe I, I believe the 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 um, the problem is uh, deeper than we think, and the media is playing a big role in in disinforming the international community and depriving them of seeing the real picture. All right, Jonathan Tesfaye, Deputy Director General of the Ethiopian Mass Media Authority. Thank you very much for your time. Thank. You.
Ethiopians and Eritreans living in Germany have held a rally under the title Peace and Stability for the Eastern Africa Region. According to Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the rally held in Frankfurt was organized by Ethiopian Forum for Dialogue and Cooperation in partnership with members of the Eritrean community in Germany. During the occasion, the demonstrators chanted various slogans that protest the interference of some foreign powers in the affairs of other countries. They have also urged the international community to denounce the war crimes being committed by the terrorist TPLF, according to ENAM. The demonstrators expressed readiness to support the Ethiopian National Defense Force in its endeavors to protect the national sovereignty of the country. Members of the Ethiopian diaspora managed to challenge U.S. Congresswoman Karen Bass to reconsider the resolution she spearheads about Ethiopia, which the U.S. Congress was planning to vote on. Talking to ETV English, members of the Ethiopian Peace Corps said the Congresswoman has been convinced about the need to revising the resolution after real situation in Ethiopia was explained to her. Members of the Peace Corps pointed out that an active and constructive engagement of the Ethiopian diaspora has a decisive role to quash any attempts that could endanger Ethiopian sovereignty. Solomon Daniel reports. The U.S. Congress was planning to vote on a resolution last week as part of its continued pressure on the government of Ethiopia. In a discussion she had with Chairperson of the African Union, Congresswoman Karen Bass indicated that sanction was still possible on Ethiopia if things won't show any positive progress. After her shocking announcement, Ethiopians in the diaspora approached the Congresswoman to explain the real situation in Ethiopia. Their effort resulted in the postponement of voting. The Ethiopian diaspora had a conversation with Karen Bass in her office um, the past Friday, July 23rd. Um, it was um, somewhat fruitful, um, I believe. I think even prior to that, the Ethiopian diaspora has been doing a lot of campaign, Twitter campaigns. We've also did um, voter voice. Uh, we've individually met with our senators and representatives locally. Um, and we've been doing a lot just to raise awareness as well as to say, you know, we, we are tax-paying citizens. Um, though we are born in Ethiopia, we are American citizens. And our voice seemed like it's not being heard. Um, and there seems to be selective hearing um, within the office or the administration. Um, so um, during the meeting, um, there was really great conversation. Uh, we had a really great team that participated, that addressed some of our uh, major concerns and um, even during the meeting she did mention that you know it needed to be revised. The successful intervention Ethiopians made to challenge senators and congressmen and women is a testament that when coming together Ethiopians can reverse the irreversible they said. Uh, the reason why uh, Senator, uh, I mean Congresswoman uh, Karen Bass uh, ha have been forced to talk to the Ethiopian community because we showed that prayer to demonstrations uh, by knocking their doors, telling them that we have our voting rights we wish that we can use next time around when elections come and we should be able to exercise that. When the Biden government was coming to power, the Ethiopians uh, believed that because Trump was uh, waging pretty much war against Ethiopia, we thought Biden Biden, would have, uh, Biden government would have a sensible approach to this whole Ethiopian agenda. But what we realized and what we found out was uh, some of the cronies of the PLFs come back to uh, uh, the Biden government different forms as advisors, as uh, part of the executive branch. And the same thing is that we find some in the uh, corridors of the Congress. So we like to see that we uh, show our force to support the Ethiopian agenda uh, by talking to our senators and congressmen and doing the same because at the end of the day this is information age, the kind of information that you have there available is critical in winning the, uh, the war. Members of the Peace Corps underscore the need to work towards a concerted effort so that Ethiopians in all corners of the world will be able to protect the well-being of the country. The uh, foreign governments cannot choose their own cronies to bring someone who is going to be uh, executing their agenda. It should be people's agenda, it should be Ethiopian people's agenda that should be uh, governing what's going on in this country. 
other forces from outside cannot be the one to govern our country. This is, Ethiopia is a sovereign country, and it has been all stated throughout our history. This, is not, uh, this generation has to understand that and fight for it, and it is our role to assert the independence of Ethiopia, the sovereignty of Ethiopia, wherever we are. Though the plan of the Congress to vote on the resolution is still up in the air, the effort made by members of the Ethiopian diaspora to let the world know the truth has been gaining momentum it was learned. Welcome back. Ethiopia is remembered as founder of the Pan-African Paths, uprooting foreign aggressors. The Battle of Adwa is the case in point. Now the country is writing new history by constructing its Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The project is lifting the spirit of other Af upper African countries to construct mega projects like the GERD by their own finances. Habta Mwashagwe has more. The government of Ethiopia is constructing a multi-billion dollar project to alleviate the shortage of electricity across the country. Talking to ETV, Skora said realizing the flagship project remains to be a so showcase for upper right ranked uh, countries by capitalizing for... the sense of Pan-Africans. The success of GERD lifts the spirit of other African countries to construct mega projects like Ethiopia, and it brings down outdated foreign interventions against Ethiopia. The scholar Salamayo Areda and Umar Red indicated. The building of the dam itself has somehow lifted the spirit of the Raparian countries, the African nations. You see, Ethiopia has taken a lead in this that Africans can do big projects like the GERD by themselves. You see, this, is, this is a big message to the African people. This is like Adwa, mind you. Now, this spirit will be better lifted up with a GERD feeling, with a GERD reaching a stage where it can produce some amount of about 375 uh, megawatt of energy. This is a big boost in the spirit of Africans. And now, the Southern Sudan is, uh, is anticipating, contemplating, building an electric dam. Mm, probably Uganda uh, and Rwanda. All this, this is their spirits are lifted up. And they learn to stand together. That is, that is a big message the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is giving to the African nation. It's telling to the rest of the Nile Basin countries that we can do it. Mm -hmm. Africa and Africans can do it on our own without uh, the, the need, uh, without the blessing from the West or for any, for, from any Western institution. That's why they, there is a lot of pressure against Ethiopia uh, around the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam because it is, it, it, Ethiopia is setting a pre, uh, president uh, uh, that the rest of the Nile Basin countries would eventually follow, especially the upstream countries. Regarding complaints of the low ripe rank countries, the scholar said GERD will bring various advantages as well as power integration for African countries. East Africa, mind you, it is benefiting, it is going to benefit from the supply of this electricity from the GERD. And power is a big economic base. It's a big power base. So, uh, it is also, the GERD is going also to serve as a regional integration instrument. Djibouti, Eritrea, Southern Sudan, probably the Sudan itself. Believe me, the Sudan will be benefit better than anybody, even Ethiopia. Because yeah, at the lower level, uh, they have their dam at 100 kilometers from the GERD. That dam is going to receive clean water, free of, uh, yeah, so they are going to get electricity, they are going to, uh, to use it for irrigation as the river comes, and they are going to be saved from 
annual floods. There are fears from uh, uh, various corners, in various corners, that the, the example Ethiopia is setting would turn the entire Africa into, um, you know, that uh, self-dependent uh, path. And eventually those who have uh, huge interest on the continent of Africa, those who have been exploiting the entire continent of Africa for centuries would lose this uh, dominance. And that's the, the source of uh, the pressure against Ethiopia from multiple sides. Both the first and second water filling of good assured the rest of the world that Ethiopia has no intention to harm low ripe rank countries, Omer added. They have always uh, tried to portray this as a, as a dam, falsely as a dam that would stop the flow of the Nile waters into Egypt. Mm -hmm. the, the first round of filling happened. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened to the downstream. So water uh, continued to flow and Ethiopia was proven right. Mm -hmm. uh, the second round of filling happened. The uh, water continued to flow uh, without any significant harm uh, to the downstream countries. Ethiopia is proven uh, right again. Uh, so when the Egyptians realized that, um, uh, you know, this these uh, scapegoats, this uh, issue that they, are, they have used to externalize their, their internal issues mm -hmm. is, is, is just uh, um, a smoke screen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just no more there. It's not a reality. Uh, they knew it actually, but they continued to lie. Information obtained from the Ministry of Water, Irrigation and Electricity shows Ethiopia is ready to generate electric from two turbines in the coming months. Former members of the Ethiopian Air Force say they are ready to carry out government's mission to fight against the TPLF terrorist group. The former Ethiopian Air Force Association has stated its position on current affairs in a program held at Bishoftu town. The association's patron, Brigadier General Tasfai Habtamariam, said Ethiopia is currently at war, both internally and externally. Following this, former members of the armed forces expressed their desire to do their utmost to prevent Ethiopia's problems and assert its sovereignty. Colonel Tamru Hailu, deputy patron of the association, recalled that the veterans had skills and abilities in battle, highlighting they had shown strong arm in the past against many attacks targeting Ethiopia, and they would repeat this heroic act.
in sports news. Lame Chagurma put a silver medal and Gudaf Tsagai put a bronze medal back in the hands of Ethiopia in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic. Lame Cha secured the silver medal in the men's 3,000 meter steeple chase, while Gudaf got the bronze medal in the women's 5,000 meters. Congratulations to Ethiopia and Alula Taklamariam tells you more. The Moroccans in a crowd want El Bakali to win.